Hi, everybody. Lisa Larson here. Welcome back. I'm here with Podcast Pete. Say hello, Pete. Hello. This is Podcast Pete, apparently. <laughs> well, I think we established that the last yes, time, did. didn't yes, we? we? Did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and how was your weekend? It was good. 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 Yeah. How was yours? It was nice. It was the night. The weather was really nice for the first time in a long time. You know, it, it should remain being called a weekend. So that way it has a head start on being nice. <laughs> well, we would hope, well, we would hope that for everybody. Okay. Well, today we are going to do the first in a series of topics in my book. Pod, ah. Pause talking, a course in communicating with animals. And uh, there, we're going to just do a short series. And today we're going to be talking about grieving animals in spirit. Uh, and it's, it is a serious topic because I know that for a lot of people, grieving animals in spirit is just as hard, if not harder sometimes than grieving a human. And the problem is not everybody understands that. And so we don't get the support that we need. But I invite you guys to, if you have questions or comments about animals in spirit or what you'd like to hear about animals in spirit, please put them in the comments below. But that's what we're going to be talking about today. And um, I know it's Pete, you haven't had a lot of animals. So this hasn't been, have you, have you ever had an animal that's passed? Yeah, and, and I have, and I'm glad you're addressing this simply because Primarily, animals, at least in my life, and probably many, many other lives, have left and usually leave the majority of good impressions, of good <laughs> memories, of happinesses, of just being a buddy. And, uh, and, and so, obviously, the loss is sort of a left-handed, blindsided type of a slap of a, of a realization of that buddy is no longer around to be the buddy that it was, uh, he or she. And so, yeah, I'm kind of glad that that maybe there is some um, elucidation and some light that can be shed on this. Yeah, definitely, because I think there's so many people that that go through this and they don't even they don't have somebody to support them. And sometimes that's even within their own family. And that's what makes it very, very difficult. And I think a lot of it is people don't understand that energy is energy is energy on the other side. Animals are souls, just like we are souls. And when we get over there, it's, we're just a soul over there. Yeah, and, and, and people, uh, at least on my plane of experience, seem to just... Um, put the big E in front of the word ending and um, they they sort of um, put everything enclosed in memories of it uh, in a little tiny place and sort of walk around with it until maybe it fades and that's kind of it. Not acknowledging, yeah, not acknowledging because sometimes I think people feel afraid or embarrassed to say that they are grieving over their animals as much as they are grieving over their animals. And I think sometimes we don't understand too that, you know, our animals, they sleep with us, they cuddle with us, we're with them 24 seven. And sometimes as much as we love our parents or our siblings or something like that, and we miss them terribly when they're gone, some of those people we're not living with 24 hours a day like we are our, our animals. And well, people don't, don't understand that constant, that constant reminder when you walk into the house that 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 soul isn't there, that little body that we're so accustomed to having there. I, I suppose the chasm is that we don't want the bond to end, but we don't know how to cross it. Yes. And, you know, one of the things that I have found but I always used to think that it's some kind of cruel joke that animals don't have a lifespan as long as we do, because certainly we would bond with them for life, you know. But what I've come to understand is that if animals had a lifespan like our lifespan, then yes, we'd have them for 60, 70, 80, 90 years. 
But when you think about all of the animals that are suffering, all of the animals that are homeless, all of the animals that are in the shelter, when they have a, a lifespan of between, let's say, a, an eight year lifespan for a huge dog to a 20 year lifespan for a cat. And we figure that we're through our throughout our lives. If we have those animals for their entire lifespan, we could have four or five generations of animals and think of all of the animals that we are helping by rescuing them. And we wouldn't be able to do that if they had lifespans like we had. Yeah, and every species has their arc of time of existence and i understand that and i i guess that's a constructive way and a good way to look at this in so far as um well I, I i do notice that people who love pets seem to um continually have one and um you know through their little well smaller than our arcs of existence they have a few absolutely mm -hmm. um so I think there were some questions from our audience that they had. Is that correct, Pete? Well, cer certainly I have one as far as the fact that um, I was satisfied with communicating with animals insofar as my intentions. But, you know, uh, you know, reading your book now, and I'm not through all the way through with it, but how how do we communicate with animals who have become a soul or a spirit no longer in the body um, because it seems like before this conversation that was just sort of out of my hands and maybe out of other people's hands. Okay, yeah. So like I said earlier, energy is energy is energy. So, you know, people have the idea that when somebody, when a, when a, when a body dies, which I really don't like that word dies, I like, you know, because we, we don't, the soul doesn't die. Our body doesn't work anymore, but our soul transitions to what my belief is to another dimension, to the other side, what I call the other side. And the interesting thing is that on the other side, like I say, energy is energy is energy. So on the other side, there's no age, there's no, uh, gender, there's no species. It's just a soul over there. And there's souls that we make connections with. And I, I had one cat tell me when I was talking to him, his mom was having a really hard time with his passing. And he, he said, Mom, I'm right here. I'm just not wearing my clothes anymore. And he had shown me him stepping out of his body mm. into an ethereal mass right next to his mom. And he says, I'm just not wearing my clothes anymore. And people have this idea when somebody passes on that they go off into some faraway place in the sky. But I don't see it like that. Having done this work, I don't see it like that. To me, they're right here. They're right here with us. They're just vibrating at such a high rate, we can't see them. It's like it's like a helicopter blade. You know how like when it goes really, really fast, you can't yes. see it, but when it That's goes right. slow, well, when it goes slow, you know, everything in, uh, on earth has a vibration. The chair you're sitting on has a vibration. It's right. just very low and dense, so it's not animate. Right. Humans and animals are higher. And then souls who leave the body and go into the spirit world, they're even higher. And so the way that I connect with an animal or a human, because I'm a psychic medium as well, but I do mostly animal work. So when I connect with, with souls or spirits on the other side, what I do is I meditate, I raise my vibration and my intent is that 
we meet somewhere in the middle. The, I raise my vibration, they lower their vibration, and we meet someplace in the middle. And I always kind of joke that, you know, they probably come down a lot farther for me than I go up for them, mm. you know. But you've heard that phrase, crossing the veil. And crossing the veil is is that moment when we make that connection and it might be that time when you after you've lost an animal and you walk in and you see them sitting on the chair that they've always sat on and you get a glimpse of them or yeah. you see for instance after i lost one of my cats kuba who i just adored black and white a tux cat we were cleaning the house and i was sitting on the floor dusting some stuff and all of a sudden I turned around, turned my head and I just saw from his shoulders to his tail just disappear into the couch, into mm. the base of the couch. Mm. And so those are the things that we have when we hear crossing the veil. That's them crossing the veil, whether we whether they do it visually, we see it visually or we feel them. Sometimes we may feel them, which gives us a lot of comfort. Sometimes we may hear them. And this is even different than the signs that we get from them. We might get signs like songs or butterflies or yeah. whatever, but that's how I, how I communicate is I've trained myself to meditate, get into that state and raise my vibrations so that I can get into an alpha state and connect with, with them on their level. And that is also one of the things that why a lot of people will be able to see or hear or feel their animal a lot of times when they're sleepy or when they're in kind of an altered state because that's being in a similar alpha state that I intentionally go into when I meditate to connect with animals. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. Uh, I know that um, we probably all experienced a diffuse as far as a presence, maybe a cloud, maybe a feeling, maybe a glimpse. And so uh, I'm sure that's what you're referring to. So in essence, maybe we've already been communicating on the feeling level. Yeah, I think we are. And I think we're always communicating on the feeling level. I mean, the connection that we have with them is love. And, and, and love is energy and energy is love. Yeah, you know, so it's you can't you can't there's no dividing line between energy. So you can't separate that. And in fact, I had one amazing reading with a dog in spirit and and this is one of the reasons why i love talking to animals in spirit because sometimes they even more though so than humans they give these amazing messages that are kind of universal but i asked him who met him and he said i was met by every soul that i ever loved in every lifetime and then he showed me just this sea of souls and then went on to explain that that's how he was connected to his mom and that when she passed she would not only be met by every soul she ever loved in any lifetime but also met by every soul he ever loved in every lifetime because you're just surrounded because of that connection to love and I know that was maybe a little confusing, but but it's it, it it was about the connection that we make with our animals on such a deep level, and the point of it was that never dies. I guess then that is the first thing to consider because uh, the distance between your talents and skills and gifts and mine via this book uh the question arises you know uh, uh how we deal with the grieving process when we feel that we don't have the capability of communicating by volition after they've transitioned 
Yeah, and there are a lot of things that we can do. And a lot of these things, some people may know already if they've had a lot of animals that have passed, but other people, they're, they're experiencing this for the first time. So for instance, one of the things that's very important is to do a memorial service. Huh. And not just do a memorial service for you, do it for your remaining animals because we don't give enough credit to the remaining animals and how they are grieving and that uh. they have to go through their grieving process as well. And the thing about memorial services, birthdays, graduations, any of these things, we do these things because they're ways to impress upon the subconscious where we keep all of our memories. And what these rituals that we do, they're telling the coup or your subconscious that something has changed, but not just that you've lost something or that something has changed in a way that you didn't want to, but it also opens the door to say, Yes, their body may not be here anymore, but in doing this and saying goodbye, you are also opening the door to having a relationship with this soul in spirit. And it's very important for the animals as well, because I think people don't think that animals understand as much as they do, but we speak words with intent and animals understand intent. And when they are part of the memorial service and we say, we, you know, you can set up a picture, you can, you know, put some flowers, candles, whatever, their ashes, but to tell your remaining animals, okay, say goodbye to Fluffy. You know, we, we're gonna we're gonna know Fluffy in a different way. Then it helps them move on too. It helps everybody. It means it helps the humans and it helps the people move on. And I want to say one last thing. It doesn't matter how long it's been. If you've never done it, it could be four months. It could be four years. If you've never done it, just do it, and 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 it can make a huge difference. How interesting. So it's the ability and the opportunity then to go from regret that the, there's a feeling of no longer being able to feel or communicate to the possibility that there is a an existing level uh, that houses and harbors a union of communicating of some some way. Absolutely. And having a relationship with that soul, just like we just talked about through that crossing the veil through those techniques that, that maybe we feel them or we hear them or we see messages from them. Yes. The other thing that I feel is so important, and some people are just gonna scoff at this, some people are gonna just roll their eyes, but it really helps is to go and get yourself a little squishy stuffed animal. And I love the ones that they have at, at uh, Ikea. They have them for really reasonable prices and they're nice and squishy. And what I've found is, and what animals have told me, is that they are able to use that as a surrogate so that they can feel you hugging them and vice versa. Interesting. And it and it makes so much difference and it gives so much comfort. And uh, it's it's one of the most important thing, men or women, no matter the age. <laughs> Um, I have one. I, I sometimes send it to send them to my clients after they've lost a, a, an animal that I've been working with for a long time. And uh, mm. it's it's really amazing the, the comfort you can get from that. So it can actually go beyond symbol. Yeah, there's just there's a lot of things that you can do that don't involve directly Con communicating with them like I do. And then of course, of course you can call a communicator 
to communicate with them. And, uh, you know, even when I lose an animal, I call one of my students or one of my teachers to talk to them because there's an objectivity to that. And there's a comfort to that when you call and have somebody talk to your animal for you. So that's, that's obviously, you know, <laughs> obviously an, another option for, for people, but there's, there's a lot of different techniques out there that, you know, it's never going to bring them back, but, you know, you want to go and find the support that you need as much as you can. And, and believe me, there are people out there who understand and will support you. And I am one of them. That's beautiful. So it, 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 it's, it's basically signposts and channels and guidances to the point and the fact that the beings are still there. Yeah, exactly. Not only that they're still there, but you absolutely see them again. Hmm. They may send you another animal to help you learn the lessons, kind of like a handoff of a baton race. Like an ally. Like an ally that they've taught you what they needed to teach you because they are our teachers in this life. They've taught you what they need to teach you in this life and then they've moved on, but you still need to learn things so they choose an animal for you to come into your life and they hand off the baton and then that animal teaches you keeps going on that lesson and vice versa you teach those animals as well so uh i i and and there are times when they come back i've had an animal come back makana came back as uh, from a from a cat that um, I had years and years and years ago, but I didn't know that it was him or her uh, until about five years after I got him. Because the thing is, by the time they come back, you may be a completely different person because of your experiences. They're going to be a completely different animal because of their new bodies and new experiences. But the way that you can usually tell is when you that time when you go to the rescue organization and then you meet an animal and you look in their eyes and you go, yeah, that's the one. Ah. And that's and what I look at that as a recognition. It's not a it's not a meeting. It's a recognition and a meet in a, in a, a reunion. And that's that's those are the best. You know, when we say, OK, I know this is the one that's supposed to come home with me. Now that I can associate with because I had a I have a close friend whose favorite uh, dog was um, the large one, the Marmaduke. Who's that? Uh, Great Dane. Ah. So every time she went to get a new one, having lost the previous one because uh, it finished its arc, uh, you know, on Earth, shall we say, uh, she would just go to the area where all the puppies were gathered with a big purse, put the purse down so that it would be open enough and just whatever puppy <laughs> crawled in that purse, that's the one that went home. I and love I'm, it. I'm thinking, well, you know what? I, I can't argue with I you. absolutely agree. I love that, you know, because that's asking the universe to say who, you know, just send who I'm supposed to be with. Just like Barnum and Bailey, step right up. Yep, step right up. <laughs> Well, maybe it's time to step right up to Pete's ponderings. Well, I, I'm not as eloquent as you, but uh, I have uh, a history of uh, occasionally being sensitive and wanting to communicate. And it hasn't been with just animals. I was a cable TV installation man, a cable TV man when I was turning 20. And I was outside in a garden getting ready to finish the installation of the cable going into the house. And I turned and my hammer handle on my tool belt inadvertently hit a leaf uh, on which a caterpillar was ensconced and I knocked the caterpillar over. Uh, I, I must have woke, woken up sensitive that morning because I grabbed a, a wide stiff leaf here and I slid it under the caterpillar. And I was talking to the caterpillar and I was saying, now you're going to be all right. I'm just going to get you to safety. I'm going to slide you under this geranium bush and you're going to be fine. You know, I just had a moment of being sort of within myself, not realizing as I turned around that the lady of the house 
of of whom I'm installing her cable was watching me. And, you know, I had a feeling of being mortified of like thinking the woman is thinking about me like, who did they send to my house this morning? <laughs> Uh, before that, I never considered that I could or would ever communicate with an insect, uh, an animal of any kind, even though we try, don't we? Yes, we do. That's Pete's ponderings for the day. You said something about it, it triggered something from a from something I said in the book is what you made you think of this. Well, I had I was reading your book uh, where you uh, were noticing a snail in your car and you and you and your husband had to leave. So you had to get the snail off your car. Now, normally, um, um, I and, uh, and millions of other people would probably just get our index finger and thumb and remove the snail from a car that we we're going to drive and put it somewhere. But you actually presented um, yourself uh, as an ally and an aide to help this snail help you get itself off the car. So that's a little different approach to say the least compared <laughs> to you and I, me and uh, millions of others who are now uh, probably um, wondering what can we get from your class? I is there something we can get from your class? Is there something we should get from your class? Because there's always going to be animals. There's always going to be insects. There's always going to be birds. And yes, I feed the crows bread in the park. Uh, yeah, we jumped into that. But we didn't mention. I'm gonna. I'm. I don't know if I mentioned earlier, but I'm giving a class uh, starting May 22nd. This is 2023 that we're doing this, and I start a, a beginning class May 22nd, and it's followed by an intermediate class and an advanced class, and it's all online, but it's all live, so you get all the same personal interaction and 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 instruction just as you would in an in-person class so it's all on zoom so uh yeah if you guys are interested please please you know look into that and we'd love to have you but yeah you know and you don't have to have any experience but like you say there are probably people who think they don't have experience but they have more than they think they do. Well, you know, uh, people like me intimidate ourselves into thinking, nah, we can't do that. You know, it takes a specialist. But then again, if a specialist is going to invite me into their knowing, into their knowledge, into their feeling, uh, and inculcate in me and, in, and insert in me the possibility that I might improve, that I might know more uh, through some sort of study or through some sort of preparation or through some sort of self-acceptance of something that I have turned away from, that I have in my person, then by golly, by gum, um, that is at least an interesting opportunity uh, that your class presents, my dear. Very good. And and for those of you, like I say, my book is is actually written in the vein of my class. That's how I ended up writing it. So it's I, I don't require people that take the class to read it, but I do suggest it because it kind of gives a um, a backup. You know, by the time if you read it beforehand, it gives you an understanding when I lecture about it. If you read it afterwards, it gives a review. Uh, so it's it's really quite um, quite valuable in in that respect. So, but I do hope you guys can uh, take the time. And it, it's it, one of the things that I do about my class is I don't do this for eight hours a day on a weekend and and just inundate you with a ton of information because that's how i had to take many of my classes and by the time i would get back home i had just gotten so much information that i couldn't process it all and being a former college professor <laughs> you know first i'm really organized but I believe that you give you get the information, you process it, you work with it, and then you 
come back and you do it again. So I do this more like college classes, each each class beginning intermediate and advanced is three sessions long and it's on Monday, Wednesday. So you have a, a little bit of time in between the two classes and then another weekend between that. And you get real time practice because everybody practices with one another in class. And I give feedback on, we talk about we talk about the obstacles that you're feeling and that you're dealing with and how to deal with those and how to get over them. So you'll have the complete experience, but yeah, it's, it's, I, I, it's, each of them is three sessions over the course of several weeks. So I just feel that that's a better way to learn because you, you process each of the, each bit of the information so that you can remember it. Otherwise, you know, those, those long two day classes, you just get so much stuff. It's like, you remember this much of it and then it's gone and, you know, and everybody takes notes, but I don't know, you know, you never get back. It's, it's never the same. Well, certainly any new information, uh, the pace is important when we digest it. Um, I'm sure many, many of us have the desire to love uh, a being, uh, an animal, um, rescue an insect on a given day. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, as, as well, maybe not the confidence or the faith in our ability to develop it. Yes. Well, faith, faith, we have, I believe we have the ability, it's the faith and the doubt, you know, that, that chasm between the faith and the doubt. And I, and I work with people on that and help them understand that, you know, that there's ways to get past that. So anyway, I think we are way beyond our time here, but uh, like I say, this is going to be all of this stuff that we talked about today a lot of it is in my book this is my little book series that we're we're talking about and next week or next whenever the next time we do this is hopefully next week or next two weeks will be on behavioral problems and if you're enjoying this we would it would help me out and we would just love it if you would uh, hit that subscribe button and that like button and the bell if you want to be notified of of new videos, but also we'd really love to hear from you. You know, comment below, let us know what you think. What are your questions? Are there things that you didn't hear today that 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 you wanted answers to and and are there other topics that you'd like us to cover because uh, honestly the topics are endless and we can't think of them all so i want uh, thank you pete this was wonderful well there and, isn't a book that i've that i've uh, that, that i've ever picked up that didn't precede a conversation about it like hey have you read this you ought to try reading that or at least a subject so maybe this is a good thing as far as talking about what you've written and what you've uh, studied and, and what you've specified and developed that to talk about it first might give some indication of the benefit of it. Yes, thank you for that. That was very well put. So thank you, thank you, thank you all. I We will hope to see you in the next week or so. And uh, yeah, please keep, coming back. We appreciate you being here. And thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Love you as always. Love and you. we will see you all soon. Take care. Bye-bye.